Okay. Okay. Hi. Everybody hears me fine with this microphone? Good. Uh, hi, and welcome, and thanks for attending uh, this presentation. Uh, my name is Simon. Uh, so this presentation is going to be about a uh, ROC ROC GDB, which is a GDB port that targets AMD GPUs. Uh, this work and this presentation has been have been prepared uh, by uh, so Pedro and uh, Zoran and Lancelot, who are here, and uh, uh, as well as Tony and Laurent, who are part of the team but are not here today. So yeah, we're here all weekend. If you have more questions about about this, you can come and see us. Um, so I'm gonna try to get used to this legal stuff. <laughs> I hope you all had time to read. Yeah. <laughs> so um, well, so first I'm going to give a quick explanation of what RockDB is, if if it's not obvious. Uh, then I'm going to to explain a few problems about GPU debugging speed challenges that we faced and what makes this a different port than most uh, CPU ports in GDB. Uh, and then basically we're gonna go over all these challenges and explain how we, how we tackle them, how we solve them in, in, in Rock GDB. Uh, and then if we have time at the end, a bit of uh, other tangential, tangentially related things about other contributions and upstreaming status. Um, so, like I said, Rock GDB is a GDB port that is uh, meant for users to I click on a button. Okay. Uh, this is meant for users to debug applications that offload work using the Rockm platform to AMD GPUs. Uh, the, the Rockm platform is basically the equivalent of CUDA, but the AMD world. Uh, these applications can be written in different languages, but typically we we're talking about HIP, uh, heterogeneous interface for portability. Uh, OpenCL, and I think there's also OpenMP that's missing from this list, but I've I've been told that it's supported as well. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think you need the microphone, but I guess just the, <laughs> so yeah. It's, oh, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so um, yeah, and basically, what what this makes it a non-straightforward GDB port is that. As you'll see, we're dealing with more than one target, which is debug target, which is unusual in, uh, in GB. One debug, multiple debug targets in the same inferior. Um, and also, the, there's new levels of parallel, parallelism that come from GPU debugging that are currently not understood by GDB. So we need modifications for that. Um, so a little word about HIP. I mentioned the HIP language. HIP is basically some APIs and language extension on top of C++. So it's C++ ex extensions that allow you to write code that's going to get offloaded to a target device. Um, the goal of HIP versus, for example, the equivalent CUDA language is to write a single source program. So single source as in you have the host code and the code that's going to get, to get offloaded in the same source files, but also a single source that can get compiled down to uh, to run on Rockm devices, so MD devices, as well as uh, CUDA devices. So a bit like a C program, can com com you can compile it down to, let's say, ARM and AMD64, and compiler takes care of that. Here, you write one, one source file, you can run it on Rockm and CUDA. So it's very good to so to or like let's say very good for people who don't want to be locked in in a you know single company's environment. I can scroll my my notes here, uh, and as you'll see, this, the, the, the syntax is very close to CUDA, so it makes porting from an existing CUDA code base quite easy. Uh, this is an example of what a uh, HIP, very simple HIP program might look like. Uh, so first thing to notice is that you have the main function at the bottom, which is what is going to get executed on the regular host, and the device uh, function called kernel at the top. And I think it's pretty descriptive what it does, but 
basically, for example, you have this hip malloc call, which is a part of the hip API, which allocates memory on the device. Then this kernel with the triple bracket thing, this is a kernel dispatch, so this basically sends some code to get executed on the device. Uh, and this syntax is actually the same as, uh, as CUDA, so for those who know it. Uh, this call is non-blocking, so it sends the thing to get executed, and it carries on. Uh, however, there are some means of uh, synchronization. For example, the him bam copy at the end, which retrieves the result from the device to the host, uh, does an implicit synchronization, so it will wait for the kernel to finish its execution before retrieving the result, which is what you want, because it doesn't make sense to retrieve the results <laughs> before they're, they're ready. Um, just be sure. Yeah, the the two sixteens in the kernel dispatch sixteen comma sixteen. This defines the size of the work grid. So here we want to execute a lot of work in in parallel. So this the, these sixteens means that we are executing the kernel on a on sixteen groups of 16 items each for a total of 256 work items. And what will happen, so you can imagine in one dimension a row, a line of 256 items divided in 16 groups. And what will happen is that the kernel function at the top is going to get called once for each work item for a total of 256 invocations. Um, and this is a simple example in one dimension, but that that grid, so that line in one dimension, you can also have a two-dimension grid or a three-dimension grid, for depending on your problem. But for this example, we're just in one dimension. Uh, so from the, point of view of the, from the point of view of the users, basically call kernel 256 times on all these, these items. Um, and so each invocation of kernel can, is able to know which item it's working on. Uh, using these uh, hip variable intrinsics that you see at the, at, at the top, so hip block index, block dimension, and thread index. Uh, there's a lot of, anyway, in my, in, in my impression, there's a, <laughs> it's a bit confusing because there's different terms used for different things. So I talked about work groups, and here it's, you, you see block, uh, like for block index, that's the same thing. And I talked about work items and thread index, that's, also equivalent, so depending on who you're talking to or which, which, which project, there can be multiple terms used for the same thing. Um, so what are the challenges that this kind of programming brings uh, to GDB? So one of the things is that the GPUs typically have multiple memory spaces. So y you have some memory that is shared by the target, and, or by the device and the host, uh, that is globally visible, but on the device you also have some, some memories that are visible, uh, accessible only by certain execution units or certain, uh, certain parts. So GDB and Dwarf need some modifications to, to, to cope with that. Also, our 256 threads of last slide, they're not going to be executed all independently, so it's not like you start 256 p threads and execute all independently of each other. They're, they're going to be mapped uh, to hardware, thread, hardware threads using the uh, SIMT execution model. And what that means is that one hardware thread will execute, possibly in, our, in a typical case, up to 64 uh, of these source threads that we're talking about. So, uh, so, yeah, for example, and, and how this works is that you have these big registers uh, on the right, it's called so VGPR01 and up to 255, that are really large registers and that, that are separated in, in this case, 64 slots each. And when the hardware thread executes, each slot of these vector register represents the data of, so we call them lanes, it, represents, it contains the data of one source thread. So let's say you have a variable x allocated on the stack in your source code. Um, then each 
in, in the column lane zero is going to contain the the data for one work item. So you'll have one instance of variable x there. In lane one, it's going to be a second, the data of a second source thread, etc., up to 64. So, but the thing is that the hard, all, all the lanes execute in the same hardware thread, so they're all at the same PC, and they all execute the same instruction at the same time in lockstep. Um, yeah, and so, like I said, because of the overloading of the term thread, which, you know, if you, if you look at the source level, maybe the programmer will understand one thread being one work item, and us, we look at the execution on the device, we look at the thread being one hardware thread. Um, in the GPU world, it's, or at least in the Rockem world, one hardware, twel, hardware thread is called a wave. And you know it's based on the image that all the lanes that are advancing together are forming kind of a, a wave front. So when I say wave, it means a, basically a hard, hardware, hardware thread. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is the high-level view of how RockGDB talks to the other components on, in the system to, 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 to debug things on the, on the GPU. Um, to control execution, everything eventually goes through the kernel. So in the Linux kernel, you have this, here it's called KFD driver, but I believe it's a bit of a legacy name because right now, I think now it's all offered or provided by the AMD GPU uh, driver. Uh, but basically, it provides some interface for user space to control uh, control debugging of what runs on the on the device. And in front of that, we have the AMD debug API library, which is conveniently named because it offers a debug API. And this hides the very big complexity of you know scheduling things on on the device and processing the events and all of that. Uh, which is nice because so it's used by GDB, but it's also used by many a few other projects, uh, so other debuggers and profilers, resources, and things like that. Uh, and it offers a very programmer-friendly interface. Um, and in GDB, there are multiple things that talk to debug API. So three main subsystems. The first one is the AMD debug API target. Uh, this is a target ops implementation. Uh, so basically to control the, you know, for execution control, reading, writing, registers, memory, things like that. And so when GDB wants to, let's say, resume a GPU thread, it calls into that target's resume method, which calls into the, 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 the debug API library, which then asks the, the Linux kernel to, to, to do so. Um, then there's the... AMD GCN GDB Arch, which is the thing that mostly provides kind of more static information about the architecture. So when we need to know the, the list of registers for whatever architecture we're debugging right now, we call into debug API, which has this knowledge. And finally, SOLIB Rockem, well, it's a SOLIB provider, a bit like the other shared library providers. Uh, when we execute a kernel on the device, the code gets copied on the uh, on the device, and the SLA Brockham is able to retrieve the list of loaded code objects from the card and make GDB load their symbols so that you can see the source, set breakpoints, load the symbols. So these are the three parts. And just a note is that the AMD debug API library is quite monolithic. So at the moment, one thing that runs all in one, you know, one process. Uh, this works fine for local debugging, but if we ever want to support remote debugging with GB and maybe GDB server at the other end, uh, we'll need to maybe redesign this a bit because the AMD debug API target, would, that part would likely be shipped on the remote side, whereas the GBR should stay on the GB side and the SOLib not too sure, but you know, we'll need to find a way either to split that library or to run two instances, one remote, one local. So just all, all this to know that, uh, to say that it's local debugging yeah, for, for now. And just for completeness, the thing at the bottom, uh, Code Object Manager, uh, that's a library that comes with Rockem to inspect and create code objects. And Debug API uses it for 
I don't know if it's used for other things, but at least disassembly. So when uh, our GDBR wants to disassemble code, it calls into uh, lib debug API, and then it uses this code object manager thing, and in the back, it uses the LLVM disassembler. So we don't need to write yet another uh, uh, yet another uh, disassembler for, for that, that ISA. Um, so, oh, and just one note is that this is happening in parallel to uh, the, like when you're debugging a program, you have to debug the, the GPU, but you also debug the, the Linux host threads. So this is happening in parallel to GDB having the Linux native target loaded and talking to the Linux kernel for, uh, you know, with ptrace to, to, to debug uh, host threads. But it's not shown here. So what it, it would look like in a typical debug session to look like this. So the first thing I want you to note is the fact that host threads and GPU threads appear in the, in the same inferior. And it was really a design goal for us because first, from the point of view of the programmer, the, it's all part of the same program. So even though they ship some code to get executed on a, on a GPU, they think of it as the same, you know, threads on the same, in the same program. Uh, but also, like I said, there's some memory that's shared between the two, it's visible. So, you know, we can have things read from and written from both sides. So it makes sense to have all of that in the same inferior. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and we'll see more about that later, but you know, we tried different designs, and the one that stuck is where one GB thread is mapped to one hardware thread uh, in earlier. So here, one wave is executing actually multiple of the source thread or is working on multiple work items. Uh, so the, the, the numbers that you see here in info threads, uh, just a quick explanation. The first part with the columns, they basically tell you where in the system this wave comes from and where, where it is executing. So agent means basically which device uh, this is running on. So you can have multiple cars or multiple things that can run code. Uh, queue is because in each device you have multiple queues of, to submit jobs. This patch means one kernel call. So that thing with the triple brackets, that's a one kernel dispatch. Uh, so we can, have, we can have multiple per queue. And finally, one kernel dispatch generates many waves, many hardware threads. So you have an, a counter for that. So this is a hierarchical identifier that uniquely identifies a, um, a, a wave in your program. This, uh, and yeah, at the bottom, to inspect those, we have info agent, info queue, info dispatch commands if you need to drill down and see exactly what's, what's there on your system. Um, on the right, this gives you an idea, a rough idea of what this wave is working on. So on our grid, our 16 groups of 16 work items, um, the first part in, in parentheses gives us the coordinates, so up to three dimensions. It gives us the coordinate of the work group that this wave is working on. So one thing I did not mention is that we have we define groups. Uh, one, there's a restriction that all the work items a wave is working on have to belong from 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 the same group. So if you have groups of size, let's say seven, 70, and you have wave that can have up to 64 work items, then you probably have one wave with six, 64 items and the last one is only six work items because it cannot f work on work items from two different groups. So it's, we'll, it will just use the leftover uh, work items from, from that group. So this tells you which work group the wave is working on and the slash two is basically just a, a counter in that work group. However, however you, cannot, you cannot really uh, I'm not sure. I was going to say you cannot know which work items this wave is working on right now, but I'm not sure, but that's not really important. Um, so how do we achieve having host threads and GPU threads on the same, under the same inferior? That's kind of 
surprising if you know the internals of GDB. Uh, this is done by kind of hijacking the arch target stratum that's there in GDB uh, that exists for historical uh, reasons. Uh, so what we do is that we push our new AMD debug API target on, on top of the target stack, uh, on top of the inverse target stack, where it's able to intercept target calls and possibly override them or complement them. And so the arch written layer, like I said, it's, it's historical. I think it was used for the SPU target uh, cell processor, which was removed a while ago. Uh, so from what I <laughs> from what I saw last week, it was actually not used anymore in GDB. So it guess it could be removed, but please don't because we're using it. <laughs> but I'll come to that later. And yeah, the slide says that currently we so we we push our AMD debug API target on, on top of that target stack all the time, basically when an inferior starts, like a Linux process starts, we push our target and only when it dies, we pop it. Uh, that's true for now, but it's in the process of changing. Like that was good for kind of up to now for prototyping, but we found that for upstream, it was a bit invasive. Like if you have, if you have that target enabled in your build and you debug a program that doesn't do GPU debugging or GPU processing at all, it wouldn't make sense to have this to push the target. So now we're changing things so that it's just using up servers to monitor things, and only when the rock and runtime is activated in the inferior, then we push uh, the target. Um, and <clears throat> so this is how a typical uh, target method would look like. Uh, so like I said, it, it's able to intercept things if they belong to or if they target the GPU. Uh, so here we have, if it's a PTID that looks like a GPU PTID, we handle it. Otherwise, we uh, offload to the beneath target, which eventually is the Linux target. Um, but you might be wondering what, what this magic PTID is GPU function. How does this work? Uh, this is something that's not, probably not, hopefully not final, that's, uh, but basically, since we are in the same target stack as the Linux NAT uh, target, which you know, also creates threads and has its own set of PTIDs, we must make sure that our, the PTIDs we create, they don't clash with the Linux NAT's PTIDs. Uh, otherwise, if there's a target call for a PTID, we, we, we couldn't know, you know, is, is it the GPU thread or a, or a host thread. So what we use, we use the fact that on Linux, the init system is always PID number one. And so if you, like if you were to debug init somehow, the PID and the LWP would both be, uh, one and you know init will never release the like thread ID one, so it's impossible to have another process with a PID that's none one to also have the LWP one. So we're using this combination. So here's how we craft our PTIDs. Uh, process ID is the same ID as the you know the inferior's PID, and then LWP is one, and wave ID is just a, a counter. So we use the fact that the combination process ID non not one and LWP one that's impossible to happen for for that to happen on on Linux, so that's how we recognize a GPU PTID and we're able to you know choose if we handle it or if we defer to the target beneath. Um, just catch up, see if I don't miss anything. Yeah, so. You know, this is not ideal. Really, we 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 wish to make we wish to make the debug API target a process stratum target because you know it would really make sense for it to be so, um, and we would not need that PTID's GPU function I just talked about. And we tried some quick, you know, quick refactors. See if, for example, we could have like different ways of having two process stratum targets in the same inferior. Uh, for example a single stack, but with two process straight targets in the same slot, or 
two completely separate stacks. Uh, we didn't spend much time on this, but we did some, you know, just we did try just in case it would be trivial, but you know, it was not. So uh, what we what we intend to do because we'll we'll want to do such a redesign eventually, but it's kind of very hard to do down just downstream because first it's a lot of changes. Uh, it would be hard to like push just that change to upstream without the port because it's hard to justify having the feature without the port that uses it. And you know, so far the thing PTID GPU works fine. And yeah, so our plan is to submit the MD GPU port upstream with that hack included. And then when it, once it's upstream, work with the upstream community to uh, to see what kind of redesign. And it might be that there's other people who are, you know, who would like to do similar thing, will have their own ideas or will want to chip in. So, and the thing is that even if we upstream this, it's a hack contained in in our target. If you're not debugging with AMD debug API, it's not going to affect you. So we feel it's, it's fine to, to push it and redesign later. So this was for the, how do we have host and device threads under the same um, inferior. The next challenge is how do we handle these, uh, SIMT, like this new level of parallelism that SIMT lanes bring. So when we did info threads, we saw that it showed for the device, it basically showed us waves, and under each wave, we have a multitude of source threads or work items under that. And they all have they all have their own data. So as a user, you want to be able to focus on one of the lanes and print the variables of of, of that lane uh, because it, you, want, you want to be able to inspect one work item at a time. Um, so. Basically, we added a, a, a new concept in GDB, a new concept of, of lane that's you know under a thread. So now, in addition to being able to focus a specific thread in a specific inferior, now you're, you're able to focus a specific lane under a specific thread under a spe specific inferior. Um, however, even though you're able to you know, to have these different lanes. All the lanes are still always at the same physical PC because it's still one hardware thread underneath. Um, but as we'll see later with this thing that we call lane divergence, we have a way of giving illusion that these, the lanes are executing at, are at different points, even though in reality, they're all stopped at the same place. So by adding this new concept in GDB comes a bunch of new commands that are almost, you know, all inspired by their threads equivalent. So just like in four threads, we have info lane that gives you the lanes of the current thread that you're inspecting. Um, the thing I want you to note here maybe, because it seems quite self-explanatory, but it's the state column. So at each point, at each moment in time, a, a lane can be in a active or inactive. So when it's inactive, it means that it's following the rest of the group as, you know, because it's still executing the same PC, but the, 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 the instructions it executes, they don't do anything. They're, they're, they're basically no apps. So in the example here, they're all active, but just want you to know because I'll talk about that later. And yeah, if you note here, there's actually a numbering error. The well goes from one to sixty-three. Should be probably one to sixty-four or zero to sixty-three. So before someone mentions it, safer. Uh, next, so just like there's a thread command to switch thread, there's a lane command to switch lane, and. I want you to notice that in the message that tells you switching to thread five, uh, it's been augmented to to say lane to give the lane number uh, because now the, the the focus context is now includes that. Uh, here, when continuing and hitting a hitting a hitting a breakpoint, uh, the the message about hitting the breakpoint has been augmented as well to 
to say which lanes have hit the breakpoint. So here I said that some lanes could be inactive. Um, so when we hit a breakpoint, if there are some inactive lanes, then we consider that they, you know, they're not really executing the code at the moment, so they have not hit the breakpoint. So in this example, only the lanes 0 to 4 and 10 to 20 were active when hitting the breakpoint. So GB tells you that. And since, you know, it's kind of, it's as if you had the many source threads hitting the breakpoint at the same time, but G you can only inspect one of them, one lane, so GB switches to one of them, so typically the first one. So that's why it here chose to switch to lane zero, because lane zero is part of the active lanes, but you know, it, it, would, it would switch to the, the first one that was active among those that hit the breakpoint. And lastly, you have a dollar lane convenience variable that you can use just like dollar thread and conditions and expressions. Um, other commands, yeah, so this on the left shows that the lane command affects your focus, so that by, by switching to a separate lane, you focus a separate source thread, uh, and so that, you know, the local per, per lane slash per work item data changes. And on the right, you, it's an example of the lane apply command, which is also modeled after the thread apply command, which shows the same thing. Um, yeah, so when doing info lanes, you saw the, again, these big, big scary IDs. Um, on the left, the part with the colon is basically the same as before. It identifies the wave that this lane is part of. But now in addition, you have also the lane index. So, you know, from zero to, let's say, 63. And on the right, it's interesting because you still have the work group coordinate. So it tells you which work group this lane in which work group the work item that this lane is working on you know, isn't. But it also gives you the, the, the work item coordinates in the work group. So this pinpoints exactly one work item. So using this, the programmer is able to refer or to make the connection with you know, their mental model of you know, that this grid in one, two, or three dimensions. And you know, this particular work item is giving me wrong, wrong results. So I'm able to, to see which lane exactly is computing that particular work item, and I switch to it, I inspect that data, and so they, with this, they're connected back, connecting back to their you know, source view of things. Um, so with, you know, with having multiple source threads executing you know, in lockstep, always at the same PC, different, you know, on different data, you might be wondering how does this work when you have conditions because, you know, one lane might want to go into the then branch of the if, one, one lane might want to go to the else, but if they have to all be the same place at the same time, how does this work? Uh, this is a technique that's, you know, fair, fairly common in parallel programming, so you might have heard about this already, but it's, um, Basically, the execution goes through both branches consecutively. So the compiler emits the code for the, you know, the then and the else branch, uh, one after the other, and you know the hardware thread does both. But the lanes are appropriately disabled during either the else or the then branch. So, for example, on the left we have those lanes that evaluated the condition to, to false. While execution is crossing the then branch, they're going to be masked off, deactivated. Only the ones on the right are going to be active. And once we, we reach the, uh, you know, the other br branch of the if, the roles are reversed. And once we end the if, then we the execution mask, basically that defines which lanes are active, is reset to whatever it was before the if. Uh, and it's not reset to everybody enabled because it's possible that this if is inside another if that had already deactivated some lanes. So you want to come back to that state uh, when you're done. Um, so this way of implementing things, the conditions, they lead to the very surprising and unhelpful behavior that if you're stepping over and if it will look something like this. So you're on the line number one here, you do next, you're here, 
in the else, I'll explain that after. Then you do next your here, and then you do next your here. So why does it go through the else first? That's just an implementation detail of our compiler. It, our compiler happens to generate the code for the else branch before the then branch. That, that's all there is to it. Um, but why is this unhelpful? Well, that's because when stepping, the user is focused on one particular lane, you know, that's executing one particular source thread. And that source thread is going to take only one of the two branches. So even though the hardware thread underneath does both, the source thread the user is looking at is only going to, uh, to, to, uh, to take one. So by going to both branches, it's unhelpful because I don't really know which of the two statements here my source thread really executed. So with lane divergence support, which you know, just, just needed the modification in GDB itself, uh, we're able to do the, you know, the expected thing, which is you step, it goes through, let's say, the else branch, and then you step, it goes there. And this, to do this, it only required modifications in GDB because how this works is basically when we're here and we do next, execution will stop at the line marked with an X, but we remember that the, like which lane we, were f we are focusing on, and we notice, oh, we're stopped here, but now the lane is deactivated, is inactive, which means we're in the, a branch that the lane does not take, so we're going to single step again until that lane becomes active again, and that's how we get this behavior, which is just what you would expect when debugging normally. Uh, yeah. Um, another aspect that we can improve uh, about you know, divergent, divergent lanes is to show what are the state of the divergent lanes. So this is something that requires modifications in GDB and some new debug info in Dwarf. But basically, without support, here we see that lane two is inactive. We don't really know you know, when it started being inactive, when it's going to become active again, like where it's logically stopped at. So with this, you just know it's inactive right now. So not too helpful. Um, with such support, we're able to go back the, or, or, or basically to, to know where this lane is going to be, be active again. So perhaps, you know, we're executing the else of our if, and that lane is going to, to eventually execute that then, you know, one, once we're done with the else. Or perhaps when that lane has already executed the else and we're in the then, and we're, we're gonna, you know, meet with it again after the if. But basically this, this lets us know where that lane is going to be active again. And we call this state divergent, so with a D, because you know, in the control flow, flow graph, this lane has taken, has, has diverged, has taken a different route than the one that we're in right now. And like, just a precision, even though we show it stopped at a different place, a different PC, in reality, you know, there's only one hardware thread that stopped at, in this case, kernel.cc34. The kernel.cc41 is just a, an illusion we provide to uh, the user. So this means that in the GDB code, we have this new concept of lane PC, that's like not the threads PC, but like I described where the lane is logically at. So we have a bunch of new functions based on the existing PC functions, but that, that are now link functions. So depending on, you know, what you want to show, the, where the hardware, hardware thread is or the source thread is, you'll use one or the other. And so I said this, that this requires some additions in, uh, in the Dwarf uh, standard. So this support for divergent control flow is part of a proposal that AMD has been working on for a while uh, to enhance the Dwarf for GPU debugging in general. So it's, it's called, a proposal for GPU debugging, but in reality, there's aspects that are, are actually beneficial for for everybody, even for you know, CP, CPU architectures. Uh, but so this is part of this, in addition to uh, other things on top that are mostly related to 
changes to the dwarf evaluator to let the compilers better express or just express at all some optimizations uh, it has done. So some things that dwarf today are not able to, to express. Um, so if you want to, like, I'm not going to talk more about this, this proposal, but if you, if you want more details, uh, Tony Tai did a presentation last year uh, at the Virtual Cauldron about this, so it's available uh, online. Wait, what time is it? Great. <laughs> Um, so last challenge, or that you know needs some needs some 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 uh, significant changes in refactoring in GB is the support for memory address spaces. So, like I said, there's there is a global address space that's reachable by both the device, like the GPU and the host. But in addition to that, the the, the device has some scratch memory area for its own use. Uh, that are a completely different address space. So if you're talking about offset 100 in the global address space and the offset 100 in that other scratch area, they're completely different memories. And the uh, thing is that this is, this is not a concept that is part of the source language. So when you have a variable, it's not like you mark your integer as I want this integer to be in this memory. It's more, you allocate an integer in the stack, the compiler decides that this can be, let's say, on the local uh, memory. So it's not a source language thing, it's a runtime compiler decided to do this thing. Um, so basically, th there's already some, I I'm gonna talk about this a bit later, but there's already some limited support in Dwarf and in GB for, for something similar but it doesn't truly really apply well in our, in our case. Um, and the thing is that because they're not part of source source language, the, the address spaces are not exposed in user expression that a user would, for example, copy paste from, from the source language. Uh, yeah. So this is an example of different variables that could be place at different places in memory. Um, so typically the, you know, the, 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 the local var variables are placed in, a, in, a, in, a, sorry, in an address space called private lane. So it might end up in, you know, such a variable might end up in lane specific, you know, slices of, of, of these vectoral registers or in per lane uh, memory. Uh, but as you can see, there's a global variable here could be, you know, either in global memory on the device or global memory uh, on, the, uh, on the system. And as you can see, there, there's no mention of address spaces in the, in the source code at all. Um, so those who have worked with some, you know, some architecture that have multiple memory spaces in GB probably know that there's already some kind of uh, way to make this work in GDB that involves uh, using some, some, some bit hacks. So basically the, the leftover bits on top of address, we, they've been used to store an address space identifier. So we stash it there and we can retrieve it later. And before presenting an, ad, an address to, 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 it, to the user, we, we strip it off. Uh, the problem with this is that it works fine for now, but it's, it won't, it won't be the case forever because we're trying to compete for these upper bits uh, with other implementations, and in particular, the uh, pointer slash memory tagging that already exists in ARM64, but it's also coming to the various x86 uh, CPUs. So this is not gonna work forever. And so the obvious thing is to keep core, the core address type to just represent you know, an offset in in, any, in some address space, and to carry the address space separately from that. So, you know, the obvious thing to do is to introduce a structure that holds both. And the only thing is that it may seem really done thing because, you know, if you're thinking about replacing all the use of core address in GDB, you're, you won't be done soon. Uh, but what we found uh, is that there, there aren't actually that many changes required to get this working, at least in our case. So. Most of the things needed are 
when you have say, a variable described by dwarf, then the dwarf tells you where it is, at which memory and which address space. So whatever is coming out of the dwarf evaluator, we need to carry the address space. And you know, when reading memory, but it's not all functions in GDB that deal with a core address that need to be changed. So it, for us, at least, it's a reasonable change. Uh, and also, there's user expression. So as we'll see on the next slide, uh, there's a way for users to, to you know, craft a, a pointer by specifying an, an address space. But pretty much the rest of GDB, at least for us, can keep working on using a, you know, the, the plain core address because by default, it's going to refer to the default global address space, which is right most of the time. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, the, we need a way for users to, to, to print to the user and for the user to input address spaces, even though they don't exist in source code. Uh, because when you print an address, you want to, you know, you don't want, you don't want to just give the offset because you, then you don't know in which address space. So we need to wait to, to print it. And uh, then if the, it, it, if the user wants to craft a pointer to a specific address space as well, let's say they want to make a, you know, just inspect the memory there or create a watch point, they need a way to, uh, to specify that address space. So we came up with the, this new operator, the pound operator, or hashtag, depending on your age. And it's basically a combination of uh, an address space and an offset, and it does pretty much what you would expect it create, creates it yields a pointer, so a pointer to void, but to an address in that address space. So this is how when it's printed at the top, and then when this is how you input such an address. And so some of you might think about an existing operator that's the at uh, at symbol operator, and try to use that, but it's actually not sufficient for our uses. Uh, first, it's in the, parse, in the expression parser in GDB, it's uh, like at data or at code, those things can appear in, when parsing a type. So it's basically used as a type qualifier. And like we said, in our case, it's not part of the type, it's, it's just the address itself that you know, has this property of pointing to of being in, in a, a certain address space. So that's not great, and we couldn't have done, for example, 0x1, the offset, at uh, the address space, because in expressions, the at is used for, again, it's a GDB invented operator called the, like, the array slice operator. So if you do 0x1 zero, zero at private lane, it would actually mean 0x1 is a pointer, and I want me, I want GB to show me, show it to me as a an array of private lane number of elements. So it would be ambiguous to parse it that way. So this, these are the reason why we came up with that operator, which was kind of temporary in the beginning, but yes, is going to end up. I mean, unless somebody has a better idea, I probably can end up. Uh, oh, hey, looks good. Um, to support this, uh, so you know, to be able for Dwarf to be able to express that a given variable, let's say, is here's its address, but in a certain memory space, uh, we needed to add some some new features in Dwarf. So first, uh, the operator form a space address form a space address, which can be used in a Dwarf expression to do exactly what it says. So it takes an address a address space identifier, smudges them together into a, an address that contains both. Um, you might think of, you know, there's already some things in Dwarf to cover this. You might be thinking of the xdref operator, but that's not exactly the same because xdref, what it does is, well, it dereferences. So using xdref on this will basically fetch the value at address zero in address space five and put that on the stack. But if what you want to return is the address containing the address space, that's not the same thing. So that's why this is, uh, this is useful. And then for, let's say you have, compiler generates a pointer, the pointer points to a given address space and it, you know, it wants to describe that. Uh, we have this new attribute, so dwarf LVM address space. 
which uses basic, specifies the address, the address space uh, using the same num numbering scheme as uh, as the operator, uh, which, by the way, these address space IDs would be defined just like other things in Dwarf by the architecture in some document, like you know, where they describe register number and so on. Um, and also, you might think about address class, which already exists in Dwarf, uh, but this more represents the kind of address or the kind of address space requested by the user at the source level. So I don't really know Open MP OpenCL very much, but I think you can use like the global keyword or local something like that in the source. So address class, which would represent what the user has written in the source, but the address space represents what the compiler, where the compiler decided to put the variable at runtime, which are two different things. Um, and maybe also I mentioned there's also an attribute called WAT segment, which would maybe have been, we could have used, uh, but it's, I don't know the details, but basically it was not sufficient. Uh, this was planned to be used for like segmentation on x 6 and like that, but it was added in Dwarf, and from what I understand, it was never used uh, ever by at least GCC, Clang, GB, and others, so it, I, think it, I think it's actually scheduled to be uh, removed uh, in the next Dwarf version. All right, so I'm going to quick over this. Um, in, by, by working on, on RugGDB, we, uh, we also already made a few other contributions. So things that we did for our port, but they were actually useful for everybody or for other, you know, not just, not, not just RugGDB. So we, you know, it's, it's things that we already either pushed or submitted on the mailing list. Uh, the first one, I want to mention is the control server design. So there's a separate talk tomorrow by Pedro about this, which I invite you to go to. Very interesting talk. Uh, basically, the problem is that if you only have GPU threads running and the whole threads are stopped and you don't have the prompt, you know, you do, you do continue. If you do control C, the current, or control C basically generates a segment that should be cut by the process but intercepted by GDB and it should stop. But if all your whole threads are stopped, the segment is never delivered. So you cannot do control C and stop, so that's a problem. So the solution is to make GDB always own the terminal and have the inferior use a terminal created by GDB. And it sounds simple, but it's not, so that's why there's a whole talk about this. Um, next one is, so performance improvements, basically, GPUs tend to have a lot and a lot of threads, you know, massive, massively parallel. So this uncovered a few inefficiencies in GDB, like walking linked list in O2 fashion, things like that. So that, you know, doing, like you take a breakpoint with 248 threads would take like 30 seconds to appear or just doing continue and going over all pending events would take a lot of time. So these things are already been pushed and, you know, they're useful for everybody having a lot of threads. Commit resumed was a generalization of the already commit resume hook uh, that existed. And it's used so that when GB receives multiple events one after the other, it's used to, let's say you have multiple events that represent breakpoint hits, but they're all going to evaluate to false. So GB will want to resume the threads. GB used to look at one event, say, oh, no need to stop, resume that thread, then look at the event, resume that thread. So we made it aware that there can be multiple events coming, so that if there are multiple events, it's gonna look at all of them, and at the end, resume everything that needed to be resumed. Because for us, doing a single resume, or multiple resume, one at a time is very expensive, so it really it was really slow. And finally, so step over exit, which became step over clone and exit, uh, that's because in GPU code, at least in our GPU code, right at the end of your function, your kernel function, when you have re the return statement, right there the compiler emits a an ex thread exit or basically thread exit instruction. So if you happen to do next over your return statement, your thread exits, and GDB was not able to cope with that, it would just wait forever for something to stop, and it wouldn't. And it turns out that there was, there was the same problem in, in GDB, but uh, in, like for, for x86 Linux code, but it 
doesn't happen that often because if you're, you step past the end of your thread function with pthreads, you generally end up in the caller, which is the pthread runtime, and there you can like continue or do what you want. So it's rare that you really step over the uh, thread, thread exit syscall uh, when debugging host code. But basically, this fixes it. And yeah, finally, the, uh, the upstreaming status of all those components. Uh, the Linux kernel module, so KFD slash AMD GPU. Um, so yeah, the slides were done a few weeks ago. It says that, so support for running stuff, you know, it's, some of it is already upstream, but for debugging, it, it's not yet. So we need to download it from the Rockem release. Uh, eventually, it's all going to be upstream in the kernel. But those patches that add debug support to the AMD GPU kernel module have been posted on the AMD graphics uh, Linux mailing list. So it's there for review. So hopefully, it will be there soon. Uh, the AMD debug API library, this is uh, like the upstream is AMD, so I can already say it's upstream. This is released at every new Rockem release, get a new, new version. Uh, the dwarf extensions, uh, this one's interesting. Uh, so this, this big proposal at the link, it's not there, but it's earlier in the presentation. Uh, there's the link to the, the, the proposal that AMD has for, like I said, GPU debugging, but not only GPU. And some bits of this, these were like, more dependent and agreed by, by many people. They're, all, they're already the object of proposal in the Dwarf Committee. Uh, but the rest of it is quite big. It makes some quite significant refactoring or changes in how the Dwarf Evaluator works um, to, 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 you know, to be able to support what we want. And being like a big change like this, we, we started talking about it with other players that might be interested. Like so far, Intel and Perforce, uh, we've met with them a few times, uh, and would be really interested. You know, if other people are interested in it, like go check, take a look at the at the, at the proposal. And you know, we were having regular meetings to to talk about those. So if you have needs, like things that optimizations that cannot get represented by current dwarf, that might be good for you. Um, and finally, GDB, well, uh, there's already some bits of Benutils, BFD that we merge uh, for you know, support the architecture, but the main part of the, of the port uh, is going to come uh, eventually. Uh, we're working on it, but basically we want to base it on the next Rockem release because you know, when, otherwise, when, if we based on the already the previous one, once we post the the, the we, have, we submit it, it's already going to be updated. So we're going to base it on the next Rockem release, but we have to wait for it to be public, and we don't know when it's going to be. So once the next Rockem release is public, the patches for GDB support upstream should come shortly after that. So that's all I have today. Thanks, Todd, for your attention, and I hope it was, you learned something or found it, found it interesting. Uh, it's a bit past noon, but I give me, if we have time for a few questions, uh, if you are, uh, just, just take the mic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have used uh, RockDDB for uh, debugging offloaded code from Clang and GCC, and I found it got useful, so thanks for working on it. So uh, two quick questions, one was, uh, does the code dump work with it? If I have a crash in the kernel on the GPU, with the code dump, if I load it later, will be able to show me the call stack and stuff? I didn't get the, uh, did you? Uh, code dump support. Oh, um, I give the mic to Lancelot, he's working on that. <laughs> it's better if he answers. Yeah, as the answer is not yet, but we're working on it. Uh, it's coming. I could have said that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like because of like AMD policy stuff, uh, I'm not think, uh, I don't think I can elaborate much yeah. more. But yeah, we're working on it. It's coming. Hopefully when it... And the second yeah. question is, um, you showed the syntax um, of using, um, 
looking at the memory in the different address spaces. Yeah. So instead of the, the symbol that you use, the private lane, can I use like uh, the integer, like zero hash, something like uh, the address space, generally are represented by numbers like zero, one, two, three, or something. Uh, so you're referring about this notation here? Uh, yes, yeah. instead of private lane, can it be some integer? In, in Python? No, sorry. Uh, like I, if I type like p zero hash and next the address, will that work? So the, the, uh, oh, okay. Instead of using the, the, the name, using a, a number for the address right. space. So the names are not, they're basically uh, target specific. So you can query the target to check which address spaces it actually supports and then you need to use them. So the identifier, the numbers, doesn't mean anything because you would need to understand how the target yeah, enumerates them and handles them. So in a sense, it only accepts strings at the moment, the operator, for, for that site, for the, for the other space name. I don't, think it would be, I don't think it would be impossible to make it work, it just... Well, it, it, yeah, you can, but what would those numbers it, mean for the specific yeah, 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 like the five, you could, you could run it. Oh, thanks. So uh, as you said, we have debug API which abstract everything and it does have some endpoint to, uh, which are able to translate from a dwarf address space ident identifier we have here. So I think in the next time we use all five, something like that. So we do have endpoints we could query to translate from one address space identifier to an address space name. And that's probably how we would do it. Uh, well, for now, we kind of do guarantee that mapping doesn't change uh, based on, on whatever under the debug API happens, but the idea was that will all the targets have that kind of guarantee or, or maybe even us in some, in some version change for this version, these are other numbers. And yeah, I mean, it can be easily done, that, that's sure, but I think using the names is it's a lot safer just for, you know, for the future proof and all of that, right? But yeah, it, it can be done, it's not a problem. There is the interface for it, so it just needs a bit, you know, changing of the yeah. operation. I think that one, one question would be if that would be ambiguous for the parser, but I don't think it would. Like it's number hash number, but I think it would work. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Hello, Tom. Hi. <laughs> we can already smell the food from outside, I think. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just some question. Uh, If I understood correctly, uh, GDB talks to a separate process that does the, the, the actual work of the debug AP, API? Uh, like the boxes I showed? Yeah. Uh, no, it's all in the same process, all libraries. It's in, inside the GDB process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. They have different arrows. Mm hmm? Arrows. That was a different, like the arrows. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here. No. Oh yeah, the kernel is not in the GDB process. Sorry. I'm curious, why do you ask that question? Is it NVIDIA based or? No, I was wondering if GDB would have to manage a separate process. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, was, I thought if it was a separate process, whether it, it would be a daemon running on the machine or GDB would bring it up and, and bring it down. It was that yeah. kind of thing. Could have been, but it's not. <laughs> so yeah, to, to make it clear, like debug API is running inside GDB. GDB loads that debug API SO library. It's all in process. And then the debug API SO links uh, with the code manager. It's the same process. And libAMD code manager links with LLVM, but we shouldn't say that here. <laughs> and then, you know, then talking with the kernel, and of course that crosses user space uh, to the kernel mode, and that goes via, via I/O controls. So that's why the arrows are different. See the detail. That's 
thanks all for attending and have a good rest of uh, Cauldron 2022.